So we'll start with the uh, uh, testosterone synthesis pathway, where we start with cholesterol. It's converted to progesterone. No, pregnenolone, my apologies. <laughs> then progesterone, 17-hydroxyprogesterone. Testosterone to DHT. So today I'm going to talk about treatments for stress urine incontinence, specifically in the female. I'd like to define stress urine incontinence, review the current guidelines on stress urine incontinence, new approaches, some of the current challenges and uh, future aims within the field. Stress urine incontinence is defined as the complaint of involuntary loss of urine with physical exertion or with sneezing, coughing, or other activities caused by a rise in intra-abdominal pressure. 25% of women are affected by this and it leads to about $12 billion uh, US annually in costs. It significantly affects patients' quality of life, uh, leading to depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, social isolation, infection pain, and sexual dysfunction. The importance of deciphering stress urine incontinence from other types of uh, incontinence, such as functional incontinence, uh, urgency incontinence, uh, overflow incontinence, is, is really captured when you do the uh, history, physical, and other investigations. In the history, it's important to um, elucidate the uh, degree of bother. In the physical exam, it's important to do a physical uh, pelvic exam and have objective demonstration of stress urine incontinence when the bladder is um, full and it's important to do a PVR and <coughs> urinalysis. Interestingly, in the value trial, they looked at the role of urodynamics in uh, the evaluation of uh, patients with pure stress urine incontinence, and there was not significant evidence to suggest we do this in all our patients. The maintenance of continence and prevention of pelvic organ prolapse rely on the support mechanisms of the pelvic floor. The urogenital diaphragm, depicted here, closes the levator hiatus, supports and has sphincter-like effect on the distal vagina, providing structural support to the distal urethra here and contributes to continence in that it attaches to periurethral striated muscles. A combination of uh, smooth and striated muscles, connective tissue, um, mucosa and submucosa are necessary for functional urethral sphincter, which provides an, a watertight apposition of the urethral lumen, depicted here, compression of the wall around the lumen, and a means for compensating for uh, increases or changes in, in abdominal pressures. There are two um, proposed hypotheses uh, for continence in the female. This is the hammock hypothesis of continence where the anterior vaginal wall with its attachments to the arcus tendinus of the pelvic fascia form a hammock under the urethra and bladder neck. This hammock hypothesis accounts for the support of the urethra by the coordinated action of fascia and muscles that compress the urethra during increases in intra-abdominal pressure. The second uh, hypothesis is the integral theory, and this really pinpoints the site of maximal continence zone in the mid-urethra at the pubal urethral ligaments here. During times of bladder storage, uh, anterior forces from the pubococcygeal muscle here push, pull the vagina up against the periurethral ligament to close the urethra. Backwards forces stretch the vagina and bladder neck in a plane around the pubal urethral ligament to allow proximal urethral closure. So there are also two theories as to what contributes to the mechanism of actually stress urinary incontinence. These include the urethral hypermobility, where there's poor bladder support overall and the urethra has lost all anatomic support. So the coaptive forces are not transmitted to the proximal urethra during valve salvage and leakage occurs. The second is the intrinsic sphincter deficiency, where there's a failure of the urethra to coapt independently of the supporting tissue structures. There's good evidence that these work in coordination to lead to stress urinary incontinence. So to touch on some of the guidelines that are available for stress urinary incontinence, uh, the AUA, CUA, and EAU have a very good consensus and, and really they're quite similar guidelines. Uh, of note, there are no oral medications to, stress, to, to treat stress urinary incontinence. Uh, vaginal estrogen has been, has been attempted as a method to treat it. However, in 31 uh, studies, they failed to uh, show objective improvements. Conservative measurements include lifestyle changes, such as um, avoiding bladder irritants, time voiding, um, fluid management, urethral inserts, which are short silicone single-use tubes that are placed in the urethra to create an obstruction, uh, the continence pessary or rings, where you can see that the prongs or the knob here uh, face the uh, urethra, providing uh, continence by obstruction. Disposable vaginal inserts that work through a similar mechanism. 
and pelvic um, pelvic floor physiotherapy, where where we rely on strengthening muscles associated with the pelvic floor stability, and that's really uh, in combination with electric stimulation, electrical stimulation, and biofeedback. When they've compared these different conservative modalities, the one that has the most long-term effect is the pelvic floor physiotherapy. So that's really the gold standard of conservative, conservative um, uh, treatment. There are also surgical approaches for those that fail conservative management. Those include the transurethral radiofrequency collagen denaturation, laser therapy, cystoscopic injection of bulking agents, open surgical repairs, and slings. And I'd like to review the evidence for each of these. Transurethral radiofrequency collagen denaturation was FDA approved in 2002. It's indicated for stabilization of the pelvic tissue for treatment of stress or incontinence due to hypermobility in women that are not um, eligible for major corrective surgery. The theory is it reduces the urethral funneling and compliance via denaturation of the subnicosal collagen. Subnicotic temperatures promote collagen remodeling, uh, remodeling instead of uh, scarring. In 173 patients with stress during incontinence randomized to sham versus this technique, there was no significant difference in adverse outcomes, uh, sorry, in outcomes or adverse events, and it's really fallen out of favor to date. Laser therapy has actually been quite a lot of hype recently. It's vaginal rejuvenation with the CO2 laser. It's used to treat genitourinary syndrome of menopause, which is the new term to depict vaginal atrophy. These symptoms include changes to many of the structures of female anatomy and uh, can, can really encompass urinary symptoms such as urgency, dysuria, and UTI. The theory in stress urinary incontinence is that the heat generated by the laser is reported to change the structure of the tissue around the vagina and add support for the vagina and bladder to reduce incontinence. It costs about two to three thousand dollars a pop. When we look at the actual efficacy of this so far, there's only uh, low-quality studies. And in a review of 13 low-quality studies, the laser therapy may be useful, but they were unable to actually make any uh, significant conclusions. conclusions. None of the studies um, actually compared to clinically approved alternatives. And adverse effects were, rare, were actually unknown. It's eight of the stu 13 studies didn't even report on these. Uh, Dr. Carr and Dr. Hirschhorn, while well, beginning that fellowship, are doing a CIHR a uh, funded study looking at laser therapy versus sham, uh, specifically in stress during incontinence, to address this issue. Superficial, that's right, into the vagina. I agree. <laughs> I think they're taking, I, I think they're taking, um, drawing from other fields and, and applying it to this field. Right. It shouldn't if we look at the actual public floor physiology. Right. So, and, and you'll note that about a lot of these different uh, treatment options. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about bulking agent, and that's not, not necessarily this type of bulking agent, but, but instead... Um, <laughs> Where is he? Um, it's actually a bulking agent that's injected into the proximal urethra. Um, and, and this is hopefully to increase the coaptation of the sphincter and act as a central filler volume, increasing the length of the muscle fibers. Uh, the spectrum where this is possibly useful is in patients who want a minimally invasive option, uh, i.e. those patients that can't stop anticoagulant, those with high anesthetic risk, those who do, don't uh, they desire non-surgical approaches, um, those that desire more children have mild, persistent stress urinary incontinence after having a previous sling or other procedure. Those with poor bladder emptying, and those that have mild stress urinary incontinence with exercise. It's best suited for women with ISD or intrinsic sphincter deficiency as opposed to hypermobility. The success rate of uh, the cystoscopic injection of bulking agents is, is lower than other surgical options. It's 19 to 72 percent, which is quite a range. The, the surgical options are upwards of 70 to 90 percent. And reoperation rates are significantly higher. In a Cochrane review in 2017 of 14 trials, they um, did not find um, evidence to uh, guide practice on bulking agents 
Furthermore, they found that the placebo saline injections um, had similar symptomatic improvements of the bulking agents. So really, we question the use of these. They are still being used, and I think it's for those populations where we just have nothing else and they're not surgical candidates. They're also fraught with um, adverse events, as all surgical modalities are. Temporary storage symptoms, transient hematuria, urinary retention, difficulty voiding, and elevated PVR in the majority of patients and UTI. And some studies have actually looked at uh, um, the distal migration of uh, some of the injection agents and seen them in other parts of the body. They're also linked to urethral erosion, and uh, rarely, and pseudoabscesses. There are several FDA-approved uh, products. Contagen is no longer um, on the market because the company didn't want to keep their cows anymore. In Canada, the uh, two agents that are used are the macroplastique and the bulkamic. So, as you know, Dr. Fenster performed a lot of uh, birch uh, copal suspensions in his practice. This is an open abdominal retropubic suspension where the uh, perivaginal uh, fascia is attached to Cooper's ligament. Effectively, you lift the tissue of the bladder, neck, and the proximal urethra here into the area of the pelvis behind the anterior pubic bone. The uh, Marshall uh, Marchetti Krantz is also a procedure that's similar. Um, it's another abdominal retroperitoneal suspension where the per permanent sutures are placed in the anterior vaginal wall around the bladder, neck, and the proximal urethra and tied to the uh, fibrocartilage of the uh, symphysis pubis. Uh, in studies, they've noted that the birch uh, copal suspension has better outcomes than the MMK, so we'll focus on that from now on. Uh, using these techniques, they are effective in managing stress during continence with one-year success rates of 85 to 90 percent and 70 percent five-year dry rates. Um, they're often performed in conjunction with uh, concomitant pelvic surgery or open abdominal surgery where the incision is already planned. Relative indications include uh, women that have had previous several vaginal surgeries and young women that desire uh, future fertility potential. Adverse events carry the same as other abdominal approaches with wound complications up to 28%, uh, DVTs, UTIs, de novo urinary incontinence, which is quite low actually, uh, sorry, urgency incontinence, voiding dysfunction, uh, injury to the bladder, and prolapse. And I'll, I'll switch gears to one of the more commonly uh, utilized uh, surgical approaches to stress urinary incontinence, the mid urethral synthetic uh, slings. The premise is this is to place a tension-free um, sling in the mid-urethral position. It's loosely placed with a, um, combined with a mobile urethra that may allow the, string to, the sling to compress the urethra at times of valsalva or stress. Uh, really, it works on the integral theory here, where the dynamic kinking of the urethra with the sling at times of stress inhibits leak. There are different um, methods for this, the retropubic transobturator and mini-sling approaches. With the, retro, uh, sorry, with the retropubic, uh, it may be placed in the vagina into the abdomen in a bottom-up approach or from the abdomen to the vagina in a top-down approach. Similarly, the transobturator may be placed from the skin incision, superior medial aspect of the obturator foramen, and passed into the vagina, um, or it can be passed from the vagina to the skin incision, inside out or outside in. And then there's these newer mini slings that have come out that have a great greater de degree of tension and pass through the vesicle vaginal space, but they, they don't have long-term follow-up and their efficacy hasn't been as uh, robust. When we look at the actual uh, cure rates, we note the retropubic cure rate is uh, quite good at 71 to 97 percent. The transobturator cure rate is also quite good at 62 to 98 percent, and the mini sling uh, cure rates are, are not quite to the same standard. So they did do a comparison trial, the Thomas trial, that um, uh, compared retropubic to the transopted approach in about 600 women, and they did not find any objective or subjective uh, treatment differences at two years. The retropubic um, was more likely to cause voiding dysfunction, but had better results in patients with um, intrinsic sphincter deficiency. Adverse events uh, associated with the mid urethral slings include intraoperative bladder injury, and this happens uh, uh, more often in the slimmer patient, and when this does happen, when you're doing cystoscopy after placement of your trocars, if you see that there is a part trocar in your bladder, you just repass the trocar when the bladder is empty again, and then you can leave the foley for a longer period of time. 
There's also more serious injuries like the intraoperative urethral injury, vaginal mucosa injury, uh, exclusion, avoiding dysfunction, and wound healing. Specific to the trans operator approach, uh, some patients can develop groin pain in 12 to 26 percent, so it's probably not really good for those young active patients. Now, all contemporary uh, mid urethral sinks are, are made of macroporous knitted type 1 polypropylene. Um, and it's not heat sealed. So, so what does that mean? Well, it allows for optimal migration of um, host inflammatory components and the purpose is for um, infectious surveillance and, and it helps with wound healing, uh, host wound healing. This differs from the mesh that's used in um, vaginal prolapse repair that has received a lot of negative publicity, publicity over the last uh, um, seven years. In July 2011, the uh, FDA released a white paper and safety communication on the safety and efficacy of transvaginal placement of surgical mesh specifically for pelvic organ prolapse. In addition, lawyers have um, advertised uh, their services targeting women that have transvaginal <coughs> mesh placed for both POP and stress during incontinence. And the media has reported on, um, uh, on these mesh litigations. Of note, the FDA, SUFU, and AUGS OGS all agree, all agree that the safety and efficacy of multi-incision slings is well established in clinical trials. This has had a huge impact on the field where the UK have actually taken away all of the mesh uh, from all of their markets so they're doing no mesh whatsoever anymore. And even people in our community, there's a couple of physicians that are prominent are no longer doing mesh in North Van and in Vancouver. When we look at the 20 year projection of these effects, you note that um, from about 1998 to 2005, 2006, there was a steady increase in the number of mid urethral slings being placed. <coughs> this is from data from Australia. And then uh, there was a bit of a plateau until 2011, and now you see that there's a, a slow <coughs> decline in the placement of mesh. There may actually be an increase in the um, other um, continence procedures being performed here. When we look at the Canadian perspective, a population based retrospective cohort done in Ontario by um, uh, Blaine Welk demonstrated that 10 years after stress during incontinence um, mid urethral sling uh, surgery, about 1 in 30 women uh, may require a second procedure for mesh removal or revision. So, this takes us to the gold standard, which is the pubo vaginal sling that combines a vaginal and abdominal approach. Basically, a strip of material is passed under the proximal urethra or bladder neck and tunneled up to be tied on the rectus fascia up here. You can use abdominal rectus fascia or autologous fascia lata, um, and it's designed to treat ISD, but also is effective in treating um, uh, urethral hypermobility. There's no difference in patient reported incontinence as compared to the mid urethral slings, and the success is, is, is quite good, but it, vary, it varies quite widely. Adverse events for this include wound infection because it is an abdominal approach, uh, temporary urinary retention, UTIs, revision rates due to obstruction and de novo ur urgency incontinence, which is much higher than the other modalities of treatment. Um, interestingly, if uh, for resident uh, examinship, in terms of urinary retention, if you do get urinary retention with uh, pubo vaginal sling, sometimes you can do CIC for some time to allow this sling to loosen over time, and that might actually um, uh, uh, resolve the issue. Whereas if you do get urinary retention immediately after placement of a mid urethral sling, it's often best to just take them back to the OR and, and size the sling right away and not just prolong it with CIC. So which, which modality is better and for which patient? Uh, the birch copal suspension has been compared in the sister trial to the pubovaginal sling in 655 women. And they do note that the success rate of the pubovaginal sling is higher than that of the birch, with 66% versus 49%. Women with the pubovaginal sling had more UTIs, difficulty voiding, and urgency incontinence. There is no difference in the adverse events. Looking at the comparison of the mid urethral sling versus birch copal suspension in a small randomized clinical trial of about 113 patients, they noted that the uh, mid urethral sling had a better. Um, continence outcome than the birch at 70 versus 46 percent at two years. And when we compare the mid urethral sling to the pubovaginal sling in a Cochrane review, uh, they, they noted only short and medium term follow-up, but at both time points there was no difference in objective or subjective response rates between these uh, slings. 
I guess it's important to note here with, with the controversy out there, a lot of people are, are purely moving to pubovaginal slings, but I think there's a role for both and it just depends on your patient population. When we look at um, when a pubovaginal sling is indicated over a mid-urethral sling, I think there, there, there's a role for it when there's an intraoperative urethral injury, concomitant urethral diverticulum, urethrovaginal fistula, synthetic mesh perforation, which they've had previously, or previous radiation. In those patients, you should be putting a pubovaginal sling. Success of the mid-urethral sling is lower in patients with a fixed urethra, and in those patients, the pubovaginal sling is a better option. However, the mid-urethral sling also has some advantages of the pubovaginal uh, sling. It may be performed under local anesthetic, because there's no abdominal incision. There's shorter OR times, sometimes it's 20 minutes versus uh, one and a half, two hours. Um, it's an outpatient procedure and the tape is loosely placed, thus uh, minimizing anatomic distortion. And there's a lot less post-op uh, avoiding dysfunction associated with the mid-urethral sling. So when we look at the surgical options, I don't think that there's uh, much evidence for the transurethral radiofrequency collagen denaturation and the laser therapy, uh, as Dr. Gleef uh, has pointed out, we, we don't know where it's going. It's, it might just be hype for now. Um, cystoscopic injection of bulking agents does not have much evidence to support its use, but it is currently being used, and I think it's in those patients that are not surgical candidates. Open surgical repairs have their place in patients that have had significant vaginal surgery in the past or are wanting future, uh, future fertility or having uh, concomitant um, abdominal surgery. And then the mid urethral sling versus the um, transvaginal um, um, pubal vaginal slings are, are, are here to stay. And I guess the question is uh, over time what happens with uh, regulation of these, uh, these modalities. So with, with the uncertainty in, in the future, I'd like to switch gears to talk to you a little bit about some of the new approaches to stress urine incontinence um, in the female. So stem cells as injectable agents. Uh, stem cells have the ability to locate and regenerate in injured tissues of the body and to stimulate angiogenesis, anti-inflammatory response, immunomodulation, and antifibrotic factor production. Stem cells can be taken from many areas of the body and then re-injected into uh, the urethra of both male and females, as depicted here. A lot of the literature is really focused on muscle-derived stem cells. They are a precursor of the satellite cell, which possesses uh, high regenerative uh, capacity. You're able to differentiate into other mesodermal cell types, such as uh, skeletal muscle, which is uh, applicable to our field and can be easily derived from skeletal muscle biopsy under local anesthetic and expanded in vitro. In the female, the, uh, the urethral striated muscles are under voluntary control for continence, and therefore this is an area of the urethra that's targeted uh, with uh, uh, muscle-derived stem cells in women with stress urinary incontinence. There has been a, a, some preclinical preclinical data on the use of muscle-derived stem cells. In one model, uh, the female rat, they took uh, muscle-derived stem cells from the gastrocnemius muscle and they, um, they injected into the urethra and they looked at uh, leak point pressures and noted improvement in this model. In a porcine model, they, um, they took um, muscle-derived stem cells injected into the uh, urinary sphincter and they noted uh, not only increased in uh, urethral pressure profile but also formation of new muscle fibers in that area. So this gave uh, preclinical proof of principle for uh, several uh, clinical trials that have been uh, performed over the last 10 years. So that's how long this has been going on for these investigations. Uh, some of them have been done by my uh, <coughs> future supervisor, Dr. Carr, in uh, Toronto. And it's really small numbers, but, but what they note is that when they're injecting these autologous uh, muscle-derived stem cells, there aren't very many serious adverse events except for sites uh, where, the, where the biopsy um, harvest site is. But not all women are actually improving with these modalities. Some have subjective improvement, some have objective improvement, but some actually have worsening of symptoms. And the bottom line is after 10 years, uh, there have been minimal adverse events, but uh, it's not effective for all patients. So I guess the question is, how can we bring these stem cells into mainstream treatment when we're only seeing um, uh, moderate clinical effectiveness? I think that the, the future of the uh, field really, really requires uh, uh, mechanistic-driven approaches to develop stem cell therapies, optimize preclinical models, and we need to standardize outcome assessments and have better delivery systems for these stem cells. 
So I'd like to touch on these as we go through them. So in terms of mechanistic driven approach, uh, Morris and all thought that in order to understand the mechanisms that regulate stem cells, uh, the, the use of approaches they allowed a study of stem cell function in response to isolated components of a complex system is required. And, and really in the past, I think that um, these muscle-derived stem cells have really been injected into the urethra in both preclinical and clinical models, but no one has really spent that much thought or time inject, in, in understanding the mechanisms of how these muscle-derived stem cells work in their microenvironment in uh, stress or incontinence. So this is just an example. There's really not that much out there in the literature looking at these mechanisms. You know, it, uh, Chen has found that with vaginal trauma, you see apoptosis and oxidative stress in a rat model of stress during incontinence. Um, oxidative stress may uh, contribute to the pathological process of stress during incontinence, and there's two factors, the NRF2, which is a transcription factor set, um, with high sensitivity to oxidative stress that promotes transcription of antioxidant genes. It plays a role in meeting uh, uh, TGF-beta, which is important stem cell differentiation, and may have a role in guiding stem cell signaling in stress during incontinence. No one's really looked at this, and I think, I think it's because uh, we're basically injecting these stem cells and, and looking for an objective response, but we need to actually take a look as to how we can optimize uh, the delivery of these stem cells and look at the mechanisms by which um, we can optimize uh, the uh, treatment of stress during incontinence. Perhaps we can look at this using a biomaterial model. Now looking at some of the, the animal models that are available, an ideal model is able to mimic the clinical situation, and in stress during incontinence, often that's traumatic childbirth, but it could be other, uh, other reasons, and it could be multiple reasons as to why there's stress during incontinence. You're able to measure the effects of the intervention, um, and it should be a durable model. So when we look at the ability to mimic the clinical situation, when I, when I reviewed all of the uh, models that are available, Many of them had different mechanisms for causing the urethral dysfunction in their model, from anywhere from vaginal distension, pudendal nerve crush, urethral lysis, periurethral cauterization, urethral sphincterotomy, um, pudendal nerve transection, and toxins, which, which there's no standardized approach. And I guess you are developing models, but it's hard to compare apples and oranges when you're using different methods to induce the urethral dysfunction. Furthermore, when they're measuring the outcomes of the in, uh, intervention, they looked at many different methods, both uh, through urodynamics uh, evaluation, but also through looking at some of the tissue uh, stainings uh, uh, for uh, recruitment of muscles, that sort of thing. But again, there's a lot of variability in the outcomes that are looked at. Furthermore, looking at the, uh, the evidence, uh, there's the role of the large versus the small animal models. Large are, are probably more close to translational research in terms of the human being, but small models are a lot more economically friendly for researchers. If you look at the um, available models that are out there, the majority of them are small model. Um, and so the question becomes, how relevant is that to the actual human? When we look at the um, uh, large animal models, you'll note that in canine, porcine, and primates, they have different mechanisms they use to create the urethral dysfunction. Um, whether or not they actually remove the sphincter muscle, they distend the urethra, or cauterize the area. Um, and they also have different methods of evaluation from urodynamics to tissue staining. So I think, I think we need a little bit better standardized approach to look at what is the best um, um, preclinical model we can use to look at um, uh, uh, new therapies for stress or incontinence. Again, uh, looking at the ideal model, able to mimic the clinical situation, measure the effects of the intervention, and is durable. I think uh, we need to really rethink our, our, um, our urethral dysfunction mechanism. Is there a way we can actually uh, develop some sort of uh, method that is, in, at this point, many of these methods are very destructive in permanent forms of stress and incontinence. Are there, are there ways we can develop um, reversible incontinence models? And then in terms of evaluations, we need to determine what are the best standardized long-term functional clinical urodynamic um, um, methods in animal models. And obviously we can't look at subjective measures in animals uh, like we do in humans, but what is our best way to know if the, if the treatment's actually working in these models? Uh, that lose, moves us along to the standardized outcome assessments. In, in humans, there has been a review looking at the objective measures of um, of uh, stress during incontinence, and this includes quantitative of leakage, visualization of leakage, as well as many urodyn urodynamic um, um, and fluoroscopic um, uh, <coughs> measures. 
in in this um, uh, uh, summary of data, they note that the the most commonly used and possible best current measure are the cough stress test and the PAD test. Uh, furthermore, as I said, uh, stress and <coughs> incontinence can have a profound effect on quality of life, and some women with just a drop of urine can think it's devastating, whereas others can have multiple wet pads a day, and they're not really bothered by it. So we really do need to um, look in these uh, these women as to how it affects their quality of life. And I think the best uh, questionnaire that's found in the literature is the Inter International Consultation of Incontinence uh, Questionnaire, and it, it has the best um, uh, outcome measure. We need a more uniform consensus as to which standardized outcomes for evaluation of stress or urine incontinence must be applied to both the preclinical and clinical models. I don't necessarily have answers as to what are the best models, but I think that the field is working towards um, becoming more standardized in both the approach of developing the mechanism of urethral injury as well as the outcome assessments. And more importantly, I want to I touch on some of the delivery systems, um, in particular hydrogels. Stem cell-based therapies have been challenged by a low rate of cell survival and uncontrolled differentiation of injected stem cells. So as you know, in the past, they've been taking these muscle-derived stem cells and basically injecting them back into the urethra and looking to see if this has been effective therapy and subjective um, measures. Uh, hydrogels are biomaterials with stable uh, physiochemical properties and advanced fabrication uh, approaches. Uh, and they're potentially highly effective candidates for scaffolds for stem cells. They, provi they provide the exciting possibility of actually deconstructing and reconstructing niches, allowing for quantitative analysis of stem cell behavior, looking at some of those pathways and um, mechanisms as, as to which we can optimize stem cell behavior and stress or incontinence. They're being de developed to deliver stem cell regulatory signals in precise and near physiological fashion and serve powerful artificial microenvironments in which they can instruct stem cell fate. We have to look at other fields as there's not much work that's been, been done in um, um, stress and incontinence. Uh, Oliviera in uh, Nature 2018 looked at spinal cord injury and they delivered uh, uh, stem cells in these hydrogel scaffolds. And they're looking at uh, methods to modulate the local um, microenvironment with nanoparticle carriers um, to improve functionality of cellular graphs. So that's quite interesting. Um, uh, Dr. Ho Shui Ling and all have also reviewed hydrogel scaffolds and delivering bone regeneration, and they're moving that forward, uh, as well as some research done in um, uh, brain like tissue. So, what can we take from this? Well, I think in general, when we look at the role of advancing stem cells and tissue regeneration field, I think there are a few um, areas, and I think um, Dr. Penny Gilbert's lab, where I'll be doing some of my uh, fellowship training. Um, is really focusing on these targets. We want to better understand the molecular biology under underlying stem cell regulation, function, and proliferation by analyzing gene network, regulatory networks in a single stem cell system and understand the syst systematic interactions of the stem-derived organs and tissues and develop and integrating these biomaterial delivery systems for stem cells. And some of the work done by Dr. Gilbert, this is an example, it's not within urology by any means. They are taking a physical blend of a hyaluronic and a methylcellulose bioactive shear thinning hydrogel cell delivery system with uh, muscle derived stem cells to assess for transplantation efficacy. What they're doing is they're taking um, uh, tubule anterior muscle injury and they're basically injecting these cells here. And you can see in, in this figure B, they have the saline and then they have the injection media with the uh, hydrogel here they see that there is a conglomerate of um, uh, more stem cells being um, taken up into this area. Furthermore, when they looked at dose titration, they uh, noted that the introduction of the hydrogel system reduced transplant variability and led to greater than 45% increase in the number of donor-derived stem cells. So perhaps by getting more stem cells to the area of the injury is going to help in, uh, in uh, uh, treating their uh, issue. They also looked at... Um, off-site targets. So they looked at neutrophils and macrophages in the innate immune system to see if the actual hydrogel system uh, created an immune response. And what they noted that there, there was no um, significant um, alteration in the, in the um, uh, innate immune system response with placement of these uh, hydrogel systems. So this is so just sort of uh, the way the field is moving from other areas. Uh, in, in my work, hopefully, I would like to look at utilizing hydrogel stem cell to identify and study key molecular pathways involved in stress or incontinence specifically and apply these 
to optimize the stem cell function proliferation in the injured urethra. And I'd like to develop a, uh, and evaluate a hydrogel stem cell delivery system and optimize preclinical clinical models of stress and incontinence. I think one of the big things that the field is working towards, they are having meetings, et cetera, with uh, SUFU to, to determine what are the best models for these systems and what are the best way to measure outcomes. And I think working with these groups will help us determine what is the best way to, to um, look at the hydrogel stem cell delivery system. So hopefully today I've talked a little bit about conservative managed options. Um, they do work for some people. Pelvic floor physiotherapy is a good, good modality of uh, treatment for women with stress or incontinence, but it doesn't work for everyone. Uh, surgical mo modalities do have high cure rates, uh, but they have unwanted adverse events, and one in 30 women end up having another procedure uh, uh, along their 10-year course. Uh, there's a lot of controversy as to uh, what is the best surgical modality in, in the landscape of the mesh litigations for pelvic organ prolapse. And perhaps we're moving more to uh, placing these pubovaginal slings in these women. I think future work needs to optimize animal models of stress during incontinence and establish standardized outcome assessments. And hydrogel delivery systems may help characterize key mechanisms underlying stem cell regulation and offer a potential durable treatment for stem cell, sorry, for stress urine incontinence. I'd like to thank those that have um, helped me with this talk today and thank you for your time.